I thought it like we decided last week that we couldn't accurately predict the the temperature because the variance was too great and the Pearson coefficient was too big. So um, P value or whatever. Last, last week we looked at humidity a fair bit, and then at the end we looked at temperature. So what what happens is um, your linear model is not going to give you a, a perfectly accurate prediction. So if we go up at twenty degrees there and we go across. Uh, you know, we'll get some number around roughly, uh, roughly a bit over 6,000. And what you'll see there is there are a few, um, there are a few days that are quite close to that line. So on some days, that's giving you a really accurate prediction. But you also see that there's days up here where there were way more than the prediction, and there are days, you know, down here which are way lower. And that's perfectly normal. So um, there's always a certain amount of er error with these um, linear models. That's, that's the nature of them. Um, and as uh, you last week, Sarah, you raised the question about the, the sort of curved shape of that. And I think I emailed you with a, an example of, I didn't want to complicate it for the whole class, but you can, there is a, you can do non-linear models. Um, and uh, so you can actually come up with a curved line, which will give you a much better prediction. But a lot of the time we just use these straight line models um, if they are good enough. Essentially, we satisfy us with the modeling. Um, so in this case, it's you know it's not terrible, but it's not it's not too bad. And a bit later in the course, I'll, I'll probably show you some ways that we can do um, we can do a better job. This is where um, so so you, you will have heard of machine learning. Linear regression is the most basic kind of machine learning. Um, it's also the most commonly used, and it's used because it's cheap and fast and efficient, and a lot of the time it's good enough. Um, but it's also often not that good. And I have tried different um, different models with this data set, and I, I will actually show some of them to you, not this week or next week, but a bit later in the course. And you can do a lot better than this um, straight line. But the straight lines are what get you, they, they get used a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you, you'll, you'll see if, particularly if you're, if you're looking at, um, scientific research in in management. A lot of people, times people have just used straight straight line models. Um, sometimes they don't, but but often they do. Um, so that's what um, I want to just concentrate on for the moment. Um, but certainly, it's not. It's far from being perfect. But you think about the practical context here. I mean, you might let's say you know let's say you're in the you're working in the entity that runs this bike rental scheme. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you start working there and some old timer who's been working there says, oh yeah, the, you know, the rentals go up with the temperature. Um, and you say, well, how much do they go up? Oh, I don't really know, but you know, they certainly go up. You get the data, <clears throat> you do a regression like this, get a linear model, you're not making perfect predictions, but you're making better predictions. And the predictions will, you know, they, they will probably be helpful to you in terms of things like deciding how many staff you need to employ in a particular day or a particular week, uh, you know, casual staff for picking up bikes and moving them around and repairing them and all that stuff that goes on with, um, with bike rentals. You might get interested in trying to come up with better models. Um, and these days, certainly, uh, for that specific, you know, use case, bike rentals, I think people, most companies would use some kind of machine learning um, model and probably something a bit more sophisticated than I've just shown you here. But this is better than nothing. I mean, this is an improvement on just somebody saying, oh, yeah, they go up and it's hotter. Um, this gives you a better idea, uh, if not a perfect, uh, not a perfect one. Now, um, let's, uh, let's move on here.
Okay. All right, so when we've just got two variables um, there, we call it simple linear regression. So there's just one quantitative dependent variable, that's the rentals in this case, and there's one quantitative um, independent uh, variable. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to do this um, in this course. It's not, it's not terribly hard to do regression. You can do it in Excel. The reason I'm not is um, to do it properly, there's a bunch of things you need to check about the data before you do it. Um, and there's a bunch of things you need to check about the results. And we would have to use up, you know, two or three weeks probably uh, to deal with all that stuff. So um, I'm not going to show you how to do it, but if you want to learn how to do it, um, apart from the existence of, um, you know, there's a whole courses at ANU on how to do it, but um, there is a huge number of online courses, edX courses, Coursera courses. It's, you know, if you want to learn to do it, you can learn to do it and you can learn all the, uh, the fancy versions of it as well. So <clears throat> simple linear regression is, is almost the most basic case. So this is basically almost the simplest form of linear model. The very simplest form is actually um, the t-test, uh, which we've already talked about um, in the tutorials, but we, we won't talk about that now. But there is this whole family of things called, which is called the general linear model. And that's a subset of an even bigger family of things um, called the generalized linear model. And almost every quantitative journal article that you'll come across in the general area of social and behavioral sciences is will be using one or other or several members of that family. So the so simple linear regression is, you know, it's kind of the um, the gateway drug for regression. And once you get familiar with it, then you can start learning about the more complicated versions. And it it's very interesting, um, but it's not something we can do in this course. Um, all right. So now a little bit of mathematics. So I. I sent you a warning about this last week and I put a video, an explanatory video on the, on the lecture materials. But for some of you, this will be very familiar because you still use this idea. And for others, I'm sure everyone in the class was had this inflicted on them at some point in their middle or high school education. But every time you have a, um, a line on a thing like a scatter plot, uh, a two-dimensional space like that, every time you have a line, unless it's a vertical line, um, it can be described as a linear, what we call a linear equation of one variable. And uh, it's commonly sort of written like this. So y equals a plus b times x. And a linear regression model is just an equation like that. That's the form that the equation actually takes, that the model actually takes. So what happens is you've got your data, and your data is just two variables, okay, a dependent variable and an independent variable. You feed it into some software and it does some number crunching and it comes out with an equation in that form. And we have names for the, uh, the parts of this. There's actually lots of names. I've, I've sort of used the most common ones here. So uh, this we call the dependent variable or it's sometimes called the response or criterion um, variable. That's the thing that you're going to be predicting with the equation. Then we have another variable, um, this one here, uh, which we call the independent variable. That's the term that I'll mainly use, but it's also often called a predictor or explanatory variable. So there's two more bits to this. Um, there's uh, a number here, which we call a beta coefficient or sometimes a slope. So that number is multiplied by the independent variable. And we are generally quite interested in that, um, as I'll explain in a moment. And then we have another number here, um, which we call the uh, intercept. So in regression, we call that, it's always called the intercept. Um, when people are talking about linear equations, sometimes they call it the, uh, the constant. So in the, um, in the little video I put on, uh, on model 
about linear equations, the, the guy who's talking there talks about it as the constant. So that's the, the, the terminology. I'm, I'm sorry to say there are some other bits of terminology that people use for these things, but they're the most common ones. Now, there's no hard and fast rules about symbols. So I've given you some examples of different ways that people write um, linear equations. Um, and there's lots of others. So what you need to kind of get used to is the structure of this, that you have a dependent variable on one side, that you have a, um, a constant or intercept, you have an independent variable and the independent variable is multiplied by something. And then to make it a little more confusing, sometimes some of those elements are missing. Okay, So there's always a dependent variable. So let me give you a few examples. So this is this is the equation for converting inches to centimeters. That's a linear equation. So what you see there is you've got a dependent variable, which is the length in centimeters. You've got the independent variable, which is the length in inches. And you've got a beta coefficient, 2.54, and that's multiplied by the independent variable. What's missing there is the intercept. The intercept is zero, but we don't bother writing it because it's zero and you just you're just adding it. So some linear equations will take that form. Uh, then sometimes the beta coefficient will be one, so we don't write that. So this is a linear equation which just adds 100 to the independent variable to give you the dependent variable. And a fairly common way we write the dependent variable is we write it using function notation. So that f at x there just means um, the result of doing this to x. Most common situation, you have both. Um, so here we have, this is the formula for converting uh, degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. So that's our dependent variable, the degrees Fahrenheit. And that's our intercept there, 32 degrees. And then um, that's the independent variable, the temperature in degrees Celsius. And that gets multiplied by a beta coefficient, which is 1.8. And then you can get the extreme case where uh, all you have is the intercept. Okay. So generally, that's not um, much use. You don't get generally get regression results that look like that. Um, that's just going to be a horizontal line at 42 on the y axis. So they're kind of variations of these linear equations. Um, it's a good idea to, if you've forgotten what they are, to kind of get familiar with them because they come up all the time um, in data analysis. And I will have to be assuming as we go through the course that um, you will kind of be able to identify one when you see one. But mostly they will come up in the context of regression. And when they come up in the context of regression, they nearly always take this form where all of the elements are present. Okay, so with our model for bike rentals and temperature in 2012 in Washington, the, these are the coefficients. The beta coefficient um, is 154 and the intercept is 3,180. So we can write that as a linear equation. So I've written the um, dependent variable. I've used the symbol, just capital R as the symbol for rentals. And you can see there are intercept of 3,180 and the beta coefficient is 154. And we are multiplying that by the temperature T. So if we want to estimate bike rentals, we just use that equation We multiply the temperature for the day in degrees Celsius by 154, and we add 3,180. So if we had a day, if there was say a weather forecast that uh, the uh, average temperature on Friday is going to be uh, 25 degrees Celsius, then we can do the little calculation here, 25 degrees times 154 plus 3,180, and that will predict 
7,030 bike rentals. So this is how it looks from the uh, scatter plot. So down here we've got, uh, this is 25 on the x-axis. So we have our line that goes up and then we go across at the point where it intersects the linear model there, the linear equation, and that takes us to 7,030 on the y-axis. Now I'll just point out that with linear equations, if there's an the, the intercept there, that number is uh, can be interpreted as that is where the line that corresponds to the linear model, that's where the line intercepts the y-axis. So in this case, um, 3,180 bike rentals is the point, is the number of bike rentals you would expect on a day when the temperature is zero degrees Celsius. And in fact, we don't actually have any, uh, we do have data for that, yeah. So the, you can see there the linear models overestimates a bit um, the rentals at zero degrees Celsius. Now, <clears throat> any questions about that before I go on? Because I've got to go into a little bit more about this. Uh, before uh, I actually have a question. I'm just a little bit concerned. Hmm. Is that like, uh, I can see that the temperature is the horizontal line and there's a zero temperature. So what does it mean for the origins of the temperature? So the origin of the temperature, so the zero there, that, that would be a day where the average temperature was zero degrees Celsius. Okay, and okay. what about the origins? So the, the, the origin on this, um, scatter plot is actually there. So that's zero and that's zero rentals. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so at zero degrees, it's predicting at 3,180 rentals. In fact, there, there are a couple of days there that were pretty close to zero. And you can see it was a bit less than 3,180. So the model is not, it's not very good at, um, at those extremes. Okay, let's move on. Now, when we're doing exploratory data analysis, we're not we're not at that point doing the kind of analysis where we're claiming to um, be able to establish evidence for causal relations. What we're doing is we're looking to see whether there's something that we could explore for that purpose. So we're looking for we're looking for patterns, we're looking for relationships, and we're interested in the strength of relationships. Um, so what we go looking for is effect sizes. And we'll talk about effect sizes quite a bit in this course. Um, and particularly when in the tutorials, if we're looking at, at journal articles of about quantitative studies, one of the things that we try to focus in on is identifying whether these, the journal articles report any effect sizes. So <clears throat> with linear regression, there are two effect sizes that we're particularly interested in. So one is um, the beta coefficient, and the other is uh, this thing called the R squared, um, which I mentioned, I talked about a little bit last week, but I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more now. Now the R squared is sometimes called the coefficient of determination. Um, that's what all the textbooks call it. In practice, nearly everyone seems to just call it the, uh, the R squared, but I'll mention that bit of terminology just so you're aware of what it is. So what I'm showing you here, this is, um, this is typical output from the kind of software that does linear regression. Uh, so this is the output for that, um, that bit of data, those rentals and temperatures for 2012. And most you know, proper statistical software gives you a whole lot of numbers and things, spits out all sorts of stuff. And you have to kind of dig around in it to find the bits that you're really interested in. So the bits we're interested in um, here, uh, you can see the intercept there of 3,180. And um, 
you can see the beta coefficient for temperature, 154. And it reports a few other things that we'll talk about later in the course. Um, but the one I want to focus on here is this thing called the adjusted R squared. Now, you'll notice it also reports something called a multiple R squared. Um, in simple linear regression, they are the same. Um, so in, in practice, we're making judgments um, about effect sizes and so on. All we're interested in is the adjusted one. And I'll explain to you next week why we call it the adjusted one. So don't worry about that now. Um, very often in journal articles, people will just refer to it as the R squared anyway. So, um, so what we've seen there, we've, I've just highlighted the bits that we're interested in for the linear model. So once we've got those two numbers there, we've got what we need to do, uh, the predictions. And the 154, what that tells us is, as an effect size, that tells us how much effect temperature has on bike rentals. What that's telling us is, for every one degree increase in average temperature, bike rentals will go up by 154 on average. Um, that's 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 how you can interpret that. So you can interpret you can you can look at that and you can say, okay, on average, bike rentals will increase by 154 for every degree Celsius that the temperature goes up. That's a, that's a reasonable interpretation. And that is an effect size. We can say, well, that's a reasonable, I think in practical terms, that's a fairly reasonable um, effect size. It's something you would take notice of. The adjusted R squared is also called an effect size, but it tells us something um, very different. It tells us, um, we, we can describe what it tells us in two ways. So it can, tells, it can tell us um, it gives us an idea of how much predictive power this linear equation has. Okay, it tell, it's telling us that um, if, if the relationship in the real world between bike rentals and temperature is actually a linear one, then um, temperature gives us about 50% of the information, about half the information we need to make a prediction. So it's telling us, one thing it's telling us is there must be other things that are affecting the bike rentals beside temperature. And so from this exploratory analysis, what we would do is we would say, okay, well, firstly, it's interesting and useful that temperature seems to account for about 50% of the variation in bike rentals. But what are the other things? Can we find out what the other variables, the other factors um, are that affect bike rentals. And maybe we can build a more complicated model that includes some other things. So there could be um, there could be things like whether it's a working day or a holiday or a weekend or could be the season. Um, it might be humidity, um, wind speed, could be whether it's raining or not. Okay, there's lots of other variables that could affect whether people decide to rent a bike. Okay, um, so we're getting some useful information there. Now there is a, a bit of a caveat there because the R squared is making the assumption that in the real world, it's a linear relation. And when we look at, you know, as we pointed out, when you look at that data, you would be a bit skeptical about whether it's really a linear relation. It looks curved. Okay, and that's something else that we've found out from doing this exploratory analysis. And so another thing that I would do if given that data is I would start experimenting with some other types of models to see whether just with temperature um, I can do better. And I, I know because I tried it last, last week after class that with a pretty simple addition to the linear model, I can get about an R squared of about 0.71 or 7.2, something like that. So I can take it up quite a bit just with a fairly small, um, putting a fairly small curvature into that, into that model. So that's what you're doing in um, exploratory data analysis. You're trying to 
um, understand what's going on with the data and what it might be telling you about the real world and what other things you ought to be looking for. You know, it is exploration. And um, it's something we really encourage people to do because what sometimes happens is people, very commonly happens, people will get data like this and they just look at it and say, oh, got two quantitative variables, linear regression, here's my answer. And how did you get 154? Sorry. I didn't, the computer did. <laughs> I gave, all that happened here is I took the two variables. So I, I had a table with two columns. Okay, one was, for, so each row in the table was a day of 2012. And one column was the bike rentals and the other column was the, the average daily temperature. Fed it into the statistical software and says, said, do a linear regression. And that's what came out. Sorry, that represents the line of best fit. When you put the line in, it came yeah. up with that equation when you put no, the line no, in. No, no, it's the other way around. That's how I got the line. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> so I just put the two columns into the of data into the um into the uh into the software. Oh look, I can show you if you like. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can show you the process. I mean it's worth knowing that it's not so I'm I'm doing this in statistical software, but um you can actually there is a way of doing it in excel um you just have to bear with me for a moment while i load the data up so uh, i'll just hide that for a moment all i'm doing there is i'm i have a very long statistical program i've written that produces all the diagrams so it takes about 20 seconds to run so um but I'll, once I've done that, I'll just show you what the data looks like and then I'll, I'll show you what I did. Okay. Okay, I'm nearly there. Okay, yeah. everyone see that? No, probably not. I'll try. I'll try to fit it to the screen a bit. Okay. Um, So I have this table. So it's, what is it, 11, 12, 12, 13. I'm just trying to find the, okay, that's it. All right. Okay, so that's that's the first six line of the first six rows of the table. Okay. And the um, the numbers there, that 366, 367, and so on, that's the number of days since the first of January 2011. So that's the unique ID for the days. So all you've got there is for each day, you've got the average temperature for the day, and then you've got the number of bike rentals. So um, this is the beginning of January in 2012. So it's the middle of winter in Washington. Um, they're pretty cold average temperatures. Now to do a linear regression, um, here's what I do. Uh, just got to type a bit of code here. So just let me type it.
sometimes. Okay. So that's it. I'll do it again. So that's what I, so I'm just typing in a bit of code that will do the linear regression. So I'm just, what I'm telling it to do here is fit a linear model um, where rentals is the independent variable and temperature, sorry, is the dependent variable and temperature is the independent variable and the data, the, the variables, rentals and temperature are taken from this table called dat.bike.2012. So that's all I'm doing. Hit the button and um, it does it. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's not, it's not a hard thing to do. This is why it's popular as a machine learning thing because you can, if you've got say a very busy so social media site or online shopping site or something, and you've got thousands or millions of transactions a day, um, you can be running linear regressions all day long, you know, predicting purchases, adjusting prices, you know, all that sort of thing. So it's a very, it's a very simple thing to implement and it runs real fast. Um, and it's very transparent, you know exactly what it's doing. Um, later on in the course, I'll show you some, some predictive models that are very good, but they're pretty opaque. You don't really know, you know, with this one, we know exactly what it's doing. It's, it's just producing a, a model, which is a line um, for which there's an intercept um, and a coefficient, a beta coefficient. So there's this beautiful transparency about it. And a lot of the time when you're doing predictions, you're quite happy to satisfy us. Um, and so regression can work surprisingly well. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about some of those circumstances. What I guess the thing to note is that if you were doing, if I was doing this for a, an academic publication, if I was writing a paper about, you know, the impact of weather conditions on bike rentals, um, I'd have to do a whole lot of uh, checking of the characteristics of the data and you know, there's a bunch of um, analytical charts I would produce about the linear model itself and the errors and uh, and so on before I would be prepared to put forward, you know, claims about causation. Okay, so in a, in a scientific research context, we get very, we should at least be very, um, very careful about how we do it. If you're using it to, um, adjust in real time prices on an online shopping site, site um, you don't necessarily care very much about all that stuff. What you care about is whether it works and works well enough. And that's, that's a kind of a different way of using exactly the same, uh, exactly the same tool. And there is a kind of middle ground. Um, in both cases, you're actually, you're really interested in prediction. Um, the, you know, the claim you're making is, is, is a predictive one. So we'll explore that as, as we go through. Um, but regression is a very, it's a very powerful, very flexible uh, technique. It's, it's not the only one, um, but it's certainly a good one to know about. So here we're just using this as, a, um, uh, as an exploratory uh, technique. So um, tomorrow we, in the tutorial, we're going to look at a paper where they use it's a much more complicated form of regression than the one we've just looked at, but it's regression nonetheless. And they are really using it to imply causal relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, they're fairly careful about the way they've uh, gone about that. Now, <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons I'm I'm introducing this. I mean, I've um, last year I didn't talk about linear regression in this course. I was too scared to. Um, early this year, I taught three intensive online courses um, where I did do pretty much what I've just done now. And um, the students made very good use of it. 
and um, and they seem to uh, seem to be fine with it. So um, I've translated that practice. Yeah.